Hi, welcome to another First Half to Friday. Today's special is a mystery, and it's a mystery that is a reimagining of the classic Pride and Prejudice. The title is Pride in Premeditation. It's by Tirza Price. There's the name right there. Okay. So, um, in advance, I apologize for not having my best voice, but I am recovering from COVID, so I can't help it. Okay. One in which our heroine is wronged and acquires a new lead. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a brilliant idea conceived and executed by a clever young woman must be claimed by a man. Elizabeth Bennett stood in the offices of the optimistically named law firm of Longbourn and Sons and fixed her father's junior partner, Mr. Collins, with her fiercest glare. However, Mr. Collins just ignored her as he regaled the firm's employees with the details of her escapades as though they were his own. I knew from the very moment Mrs. Davis pleaded her case with us that something was not quite right about her story. Her husband accused of embezzlement and she, a clerk's wife, dressed like a baroness. He let out a loud abrasive laugh that made Lizzie's head ache. Mr. Collins was too preoccupied with his own importance to pay attention to something as trivial as the state of a woman's clothes. If Lizzie were to demand that he close his eyes and name the color of her own Spencer, she doubted that he'd be able to. It was a fine emerald brocade, let the record show. Her older sister Jane had said once that the jacket's color made Lizzie's eyes look bright. Lizzie's father, Mr. Bennett, listened to Mr. Collins' account with the patience of a man who had a lot of experience in enduring long-windedness. And what happened next? I made the appropriate inquiries, but still had my suspicions. I called upon Mr. Davis three days later to question her some more. At one point, She became so flustered that she excused herself, allowing me time to uh, glance upon her writing desk. I hope that I may find some stray sum sheet or a letter. Mr. Collins fumbled and Lizzie raised her eyebrows. Oh, is that so? She said. Nobody paid attention to Lizzie. And Mr. Collins continued. In fact, I found a rather intimate note signed J.A. I found that highly suspicious, so I questioned the neighbors and learned that Mrs. Davis stepped out at the same time every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. She often didn't return for hours. I followed her the next day, and that's when I discovered the identity of J.A., John Alliston, her husband's boss. Lizzie's friend Charlotte Lucas gasped audibly from her desk. As Longbourn's secretary, she was privy to many scandalous details of the firm's various cases, but they were rarely as salacious as this. It had been precisely Lizzie's reaction when she'd discovered that Mrs. Davis had been having an affair with the very man who accused her husband James of embezzlement. It was a very devious, clever setup, and now I turn the case over to you, sir, as barrister, to prove our client's innocence and demand justice. With great ceremony, Mr. Collins handed over the letters Lizzie had pilfered from Mrs. Davis's writing desk and gave a slight bow to his audience. Longbourn and Sons was not a very large firm. It consisted of her father, boorish and barely 20-year-old Collins, three other solicitors, two clerks, and Charlotte the secretary. Nevertheless, Lizzie seethed as she watched Collins publicly claim credit for the evidence that she herself had discovered. I am going to wring his neck, she muttered, just loudly enough for Charlotte to cast a concerned glance in her direction. 
The important thing is that an innocent man will soon be free, Charlotte said. I suppose. Lizzie, you know that in all likelihood, Charlotte trailed off, knowing that she was dredging up something Lizzie knew all too well. She could not argue Mr. Davis's case herself, no matter how much she longed to be called to the bar. It was no matter, even if the courts would allow for a woman barrister. First, she would have to convince her father that such a calling was appropriate for his beloved 17-year-old daughter. I know what Lizzie said, but that doesn't mean he had any right to steal my work. Collins accepted handshakes and claps on the shoulder from the other solicitors and clerks while Mr. Bennett studied the letters. Gradually the room quieted again as they waited for Mr. Bennett to pronounce his judgment. This is good, Collins, very good. I will speak to the magistrate straight away. He paused heavily and added, Of course, our client is not innocent. Oh, yes, he is. I've just told you, sir. Collins smiled at Mr. Bennett in a condescending manner that Lizzie was positively loathing. Lizzie's greatest strength was the quickness of her mind, but her greatest weakness, according to her mother, was the quickness of her tongue. Our client is Mrs. Davis, she proclaimed loudly, unable to stand it any longer, and she is most certainly guilty. Truly, the amount of patience Lizzie had to exert in this office was immeasurable. Colin should have been embarrassed by his fumble, but he didn't appear to be. In fact, he didn't even turn to acknowledge the young woman who corrected him. Mr. Davis, Mrs. Davis, who cares? I should think that Mr. Davis would be so indebted to us for securing his release from prison that he'd be willing to pay us a small fortune. Don't count on it. The nature of marriage is mysterious, and besides, Mr. Davis may not have the funds. Mr. Bennett sighed. Papa, James Davis is the younger nephew of a baronet, Lizzie interjected. By marriage, but but perhaps he'll be able to be grateful to the firm for keeping his relative's name out of the mud. Lizzie let the suggestion dangle, enjoying the way that Colin's eyes bulged with shock. How do you know that? Mrs. Davis told me herself. Did she not mention that when you called? Lizzie let her stare dig into Collins, hoping for some veil of regret or shame. But finding none, she turned back to her father and said, It's quite marvelous the things one hears when visiting Miss Lucas. Visiting Miss Lucas was the code phrase that Lizzie and her father used when Lizzie helped around the office. Longbourn and Sons, though well-established and in good reputation, was not a flourishing business. Between Mr. Bennett's preference for studying the law rather than practicing it and his bumbling junior partner, the firm struggled, even with Lizzie's assistance behind the scenes. Very good, Mr. Bennett said. Step into my office, if you please, Elizabeth. Lizzie was all too glad to sweep past an irritated Collins and into her father's office. It was frightfully messy and her favorite room in all the world. It always smelled of ink and paper and rich pipe tobacco, which her mother strictly forbade her father from enjoying at home. The surface of the great oak desk was covered in books, papers, and a good number of half-emptied ink pots. Although the mess itched at Lizzie's inclination for order, she loved everything that his room represented. Knowledge, hard work, quick thinking, the pursuit of justice. The cases that unfolded in this room were far more fascinating to her than any drama that could occur in a drawing room. Papa, she began once they were seated, Mr. Collins has been lying again. Of course he has. Do you think that I'd believe for an instant that Collins would call upon Mrs. Davis? He doesn't have an enterprising bone in his body. Lizzie smiled. Good. This is going to be easier than she'd thought. 
However, you mustn't goad him in front of the others, Elizabeth. He will be their superior one day, and it does no good to make him look like a fool. The smile slipped from Lizzie's face. This argument again. Mr. Davis was going to hang, and Mr. Collins would have done nothing to stop it. I only told him because you were out, and the hearing's set for tomorrow. Is that the only reason? her father asked. Lizzie cast her gaze at a smear of ink on the wood in the desk. Her father was likely out blotting sand again. She had better stop by the stationer on the way home. Oh, no. I'd heard him say nothing was to be done as I came in, with my evidence, and I couldn't help it. Disagreeing with Mr. Collins is entirely too enjoyable. It is one thing to be right, Mr. Bennet said, but it is quite another to always be proclaiming it. Anyone with half a brain could see that Mrs. Davis and Mr. Alston set poor Mr. Davis up, likely with the intent to marry once he was out of the way. And we know you have far more than half a brain. If that's the case, then you should hire me instead of some stranger. Lizzie had intended to surprise her father, but he looked as if he'd been expecting this change in topic. Ah, uh, you've been speaking to Charlotte? I read the job advertisement myself, Lizzie said. As your unofficial accountant and assistant, I must advise you that hiring another person is not in the firm's best financial interest right now. He picked up a stack of contracts that Lizzie herself had proved and set upon his desk for final approval and signatures. If Collins is to become a barrister and spend all his time in court, that will leave us short a solicitor. Better to bring someone on now before we're shorthanded. Lizzie ground her teeth so as not to say what she was really thinking. Collins was utterly useless. He was lazy and created more work than he shouldered. Lizzie and her father were constantly tidying up his messes. In her view, his failings as a solicitor, where he were merely expected to attend legal matters outside of court, did not foretell success as a barrister where he would be expected to represent clients in court of law. For whatever reason, her father refused to see the truth. It was as if he expected that attending an inn of court to become a barrister would transform Collins into a different man. Perhaps it was because Mr. Collins was the sole heir to the Bennett family business and to the much diminished fortune. Perhaps it was simply because Collins was his cousin's son. Either way, when Collins had arrived at their doorstep with a benefactress and passable letters of recommendation, Lizzie's father took him in like the son he didn't have. But if you must hire someone now, why not me? Lizzie pressed. I already do much of the work, and I could act as an unpaid apprentice until we're turning a profit again, and... Elizabeth, her father interrupted. I can't go against your mother's wishes where your future is concerned. Both father and daughter sat up marginally straighter as if simply mentioning Mrs. Bennet might summon her from thin air. The idea was absurd, since Lizzie couldn't remember her mother ever setting foot in Longbourn and Sons. The very act of entering the business might actually bring on one of those dizzy spells, which she was always on the verge of succumbing to. Mama means well, Lizzie said, which was really a generous way of saying Mrs. Bennet didn't know Lizzie at all. But I don't wish to marry a barrister. I wish to be one. I wish for your support more than anyone's. Mr. Bennett gifted Lizzie one of his small, delighted smiles. Lizzie was certain. She was the only one who saw this side of her father, lively and amused at small rebellion. It was not spoken of, but it was no secret that Lizzie and Mr. Bennett had a very special bond. Oh, her older sister Jane was lovely and polite and considerate, and if Lizzie were quite honest, the only one of the lot who would never embarrass her father. But her younger sisters Mary, Lydia, and Kitty were not interested in anything beyond the drawing room. 
Lizzie was certain that her father secretly wished she had been born a boy, and while Lizzie had no complaints about being a young woman, sometimes she wished she weren't a young lady. It would be an unusual situation, Lizzie acknowledged, but I'm 17 now, and if I were your son, you wouldn't hesitate to offer me the position. Mr. Bennet regarded her for a long moment, and Lizzie hardly breathed in the hope he was considering her point of view. If he gave in on this one thing, then perhaps, perhaps he would allow her one day to train as a barrister. She would show up Collins in every way, and if it would convince her father, I'm not overlooking your argument, she would show up Collins in every way, if it would convince her father. I'm not overlooking your argument, he said finally although your mode of persuasion relies a bit too heavily on pathos. Lizzie would have laughed if their conversation had a different tone. Her father had been the first one to teach her about Aristotle's method of persuasion, pathos, ethos, and lakos. Pathos was a method of appealing to her father's emotion, which was exactly what she was attempting to do. The barrister picked up on it, of course. Considering I have no authority or experience and cannot use ethos, I assumed you would have me rely on Lagos, or Lagos, she said. Mr. Bennett chuckled. If you can convince me that I should hire you using logic and facts, then I shall consider it, which is a good offer considering how much your mother will berate me for doing so. She wasn't sure if he was simply humoring her, but Lizzie began to mount in offensive anyway. I solved the Davis case. Mr. Collins took my work, and I am more than competent. I assigned the case to Collins, her father countered. No, prove to me you're suitable for this job, and leave your contempt for Collins out of it. Lizzie turned his proposal over in her mind, torn between excitement at an opportunity and resentment that she must work doubly hard to prove herself worthy for something that Collins had merely been handed. She knew she should just accept it. It would be the best offer she would receive, but her instinct to argue kept her from doing so. As if sensing Lizzie's inner turmoil, Mr. Bennett leaned across his atrociously cluttered desk and added, I do appreciate you, and your work on contracts is invaluable. And who knows? Perhaps marrying a barrister one day in the far future wouldn't be such a bad fate. Lizzie folded her arms across her chest. I won't marry Mr. Collins. Mr. Bennett looked terrified at the thought. Oh, heavens no. Lizzie stopped at Charlotte's desk on her way out, pausing to adjust her bonnet and pull on her gloves. Is he sending you home? Charlotte asked quietly. Not precisely. Lizzie knew that was where her father fully expected her to return, but she never convinced him to hire her if she simply sat in her room and worked on her needlepoint. He said that he'd hire me for the position if I can convince him using logic. Well, that should be easy enough for you, Charlotte said, unflaggingly supportive. Lizzie sighed. The problem is, I've already proved him with ample examples of why I'm the best candidate. I do most of Mr. Collins' work. I already know how the firm functions, and I read most of the contracts. What more must I do? Charlotte cast her gaze about for any lurking clerks, and then she whispered, What if you take a peek at an incoming case, the ones that haven't been assigned yet? She slid open the drawer where she kept the inquiries for representation, filed by complaint type and sender. She waved Lizzie to come behind her desk and to look for herself. If you could find a few moderately difficult cases, preferably by those who could pay. Oh, you're very sly, Lizzie said approvingly and began flicking through the letters. This is why you're such an excellent secretary. I hardly think your father hired me for my ability to sneak about, Charlotte said. 
He hired you because he needed someone reliable and organized. Lizzie extracted a letter and scanned it before discarding it. Fidelity cases were so boring. Now, if only he'd extend his daughter the same consideration. Don't be so hard on him. I wouldn't work if I didn't have to, and if I had a father such as yours. I know, Lizzie said, recognizing the longing in her friend's tone. Charlotte was the daughter of a successful merchant and a beautiful woman from West Indies. Their marriage had been quite a scandal at the time, but they passed away when Charlotte was just a baby, and she was brought up by her father's business partner, a friend of Mr. Bennett's. She took a job at Longbourn when she failed to find a husband by the age of 23, and not only was she organized and capable, but she was a great confidant to Lizzie. But think of this. How marvelous would it be for you and I if we both worked here? Charlotte smiled weakly back. Quite marvelous. So find yourself a perfect case. But their plodding was halted by the sound of a male throat clearing behind them. Miss Elizabeth, rifling through the files again? Lizzie started guiltily and rose up from her crouch position near the file drawer. Colin stepped forward and made an admirable effort of looking down at her, which was difficult as Lizzie was a good three inches of height on him. Mr. Collins, she said flatly. She stared him down and wondered if he felt anything for what he had done earlier. Embarrassment, guilt, remorse. Shouldn't you be home sewing? He asked in a flippant tone. His satisfied smirk told Lizzie all she needed to know about his supposed guilt or lack thereof. Or perhaps performing another task befitting your position. When she was very angry, Lizzie found it best to count something, anything in sight, until she calmed down. She picked the gleaming brass buttons on Colin's jacket. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now she could respond. And what position would that be, she asked. A lady and an unmarried one at that. I hardly think that my sex or my marital status concerns you. Oh, but they might. Collins held Lizzie's gaze for longer than necessary, and Lizzie felt the greatest urge to try out some language she'd happened to overhear on one of her reconnaissance missions down by the docks. First, He had refused to do his job with Mrs. Davis. Then he'd stolen her work without acknowledgement. And now he was implying some kind of budding relationship between them. In the end, Lizzie just chose insult by way of Shakespeare. It felt more dignified. I do wish that we could become better strangers, she said coldly. It took Collins a moment to register her jab, and his faux-polite expression darkened into an open resentment. He reached behind Lizzie and slammed the file drawer shut. These files are confidential business of Longbourn and Sons, Miss Elizabeth. Lizzie felt her cheeks redden. My father? Oh, yes, let's go speak with your father about how you're meddling with the firm's business yet again. Ugh, he had her there. Mr. Bennett had just told her to leave Collins out of her argument. How would it look if she marched right back to his office, not five minutes later, complaining that he was getting in her way? Lizzie longed to say something smart, to knock the disagreeable smile off of his face. But before she could come up with something clever, the front door of the office was thrown open with a dramatic bang. Lizzie, Collins, and Charlotte all looked in that direction and saw no one. But wait, no. Lizzie looked down. A short boy with the grime of a street urchin, but smartly attired in a jacket and cap, caught sight of her. He snatched his threadbare hat from his head. Beckon your pardon, missus, he gasped in between massive heaves for breath. I didn't mean to startle. But gone from these premises at once, Mr. Collins thundered. Lizzie thought darkly it was likely the first time all week that he had someone shorter than he to order about. This is a respectable office of law, 
Oh, stand down, Mr. Collins, Lizzie said, hardly able to keep the smile in check. He's here to see me. What business would you have with an urchin? Business that doesn't concern you. Lizzie glared at Collins again, before gesturing to invite the boy into the office. Come along, Fred. Fred was still panting when Lizzie ushered him to a vacant desk in the corner, so Lizzie guided him to the chair and fetched him a glass of water. She had met Fred a few months earlier and so admired his observational skills that she occasionally employed him to report information to her, particularly if any gentlemen were ever led down Bow Street by a runner. Longbourn and Sons needed all the help they could get rustling up business, and knowing who had been arrested before it reached the society papers was very useful. Fred drank the water in a series of quick gulps. Lizzie knew she should let him collect himself before pressing him for information, but he had never before intruded past the doors of Longbourn and Sons to seek her out. A rush of excitement flooded Lizzie, in the very same rush that she had felt when she had called on Mrs. Davis and uncovered the letter to her lover. Perhaps she didn't need to access Charlotte's drawer of inquiries after all. Even so, in all her excitement, Lizzie never could have imagined that when the boy finally caught his breath, he'd look up and say, Miss, there's been a murder. Isn't that a wonderful opening? Um, the book did this, such a, the author did a great job of weaving um, some of the most famous scenes of Pride and Prejudice and some of the great quotes. And um, she kept the flavor of a lot of the characters, though some of them she completely reimagined. So you never know exactly who's who and what's going to happen next. So a wonderful mystery to recommend to you. I'm going to do a month of mystery reading, and I hope you enjoy them and that you'll tune in next Friday. And I'll be much better with a better voice. Okay, thank you for watching.